Welcome back to another lecture night at the David Dunlap Observatory online with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre. My name is Denise Chilton and I am the RASC Toronto Centre DDO Committee Chair. I'm happy to be your host for tonight's lecture. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's mission is to enhance understanding of and inspire curiosity about the universe through public outreach, education and support for astronomical research. In partnership with the City of Richmond Hill, RASC hosts outreach activities at the David Dunlap Observatory, or DDO. The observatory is home to Canada's largest optical telescope. While we miss working from the DDO facility, we are happy to bring you the lecture nights we had planned for this summer through this webcast instead. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's lecture, astrophysicist Mohamed Shaban. Shaban is a doctoral candidate in physics at the University of Toronto. He holds an undergraduate degree in physics and mathematics at UBC Vancouver. His research focuses on large scale structure cosmology and instrumentation. That is the science of developing instruments and experiments to perform scientific measurements. Shaban is especially interested in experimentally probing the nature of dark matter and dark energy. His current work with the Balloon Astrophysics Group aims to build a balloon-borne observatory that operates in the stratosphere. Apart from his research interests, Shaban is also a world traveler and has visited over 130 cities in over 30 countries with the goal of trying at least one ice cream store per city. Tonight, Shaban will talk about weighing the universe with a balloon-borne telescope. If you, our viewers, have questions for Shaban, please ask them in the YouTube chat he will have some time to answer questions at the end of his talk. Without further ado, welcome Mohammed Shaban. Thank you for this very kind introduction. So as was just mentioned, my name is Shaban and today I'll be talking to you about weighing the universe with a balloon born telescope. Before I start, I wanna just give a, a small warning that I have a cute little dog in my house that will sometimes bark. So if you hear him, my apologies. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna get right into it. As you might have noticed, the title is a little bit peculiar, Weighing the Universe with a balloon Born Telescope. So today's talk is designed in such a way that we'll just break down this title into three components. First, I want to answer the question, why do we care about weighing the universe? Why is that something that the scientific community cares about? After that, I'm going to answer the question, how do we weigh the universe? And finally, I'll talk about the balloon part of the title. And, you know, it's, it's probably what you're thinking, which is a telescope hanging from a giant balloon. But more on that later. So we can get right to it. Why do we care about weighing the universe? Now, why is this something that the scientific community cares about? And to understand why we care, we have to take a step back and ask a couple of more fundamental questions. Questions like, you know, what's the universe or, or how much stuff is in the universe? Uh, and, and these questions are, are fairly big, fundamental, difficult questions. And, you know, I could come out here and just tell you the state of the art answers and, and hope that you just accept them. But instead, what I'm gonna to try to do today is I want to try via analogy, help you look at this from the perspective of an experimental scientist. So instead of asking the question, how much stuff is in the universe, let us play a little bit of a game. It's called the jelly bean game. Uh, I'm sure you must have seen it in like a fair or on the streets. And the game is essentially someone has a jar filled with some sort of candy, like jelly bean or lollipop or bubble gum. And you make a guess. You guess how many jelly beans there are in the jar. And the person who gets the guess that's closest to reality gets some sort of award. And, you know, this is the analogy we're going to use to answer the question, how much stuff is in the universe? So we're going to play this game, except we're going to play scientifically. This is my dog. He's a good scientist and he wants the treats. So what he's going to do is he's going to sit down and devise a series of experiments to determine how many jelly beans there are in the jar. And he came up with three ideas. The first, which is the simplest one, is he could just open the jar Take out the jelly beans one by one, you know, one jelly bean, two jelly bean, and count them. And that'll give you the total number of jelly beans. Equally, you could have just taken the jar, put it on a scale to weigh it, find out the total weight of the jar. You know how much each jelly bean weighs, and you can divide the total weight by the weight of a jelly bean to get how many jelly beans there are in the jar. And then a third experiment is you could use the energy contents of the jar. And in the case of jelly beans, that's just the calories. So you can look at the total calories in the jar, you know how many calories each jelly bean is, you divide and you get the number. So these are three 
fairly simple experiments that if done properly should give us the number of jelly beans in the jar. So let's pretend that we have a jar of jelly beans and we conduct those experiments. So we start with the energy experiment. We find out there's 100 calories. There's one calorie per jelly bean. So we did use that there must be 100 jelly beans, right? Simple enough. We then move on to our second experiment and we weigh the jar and we find that the jar weighs only 30 grams and we know that each jelly bean weighs one gram and that suggests that there are only 30 jelly beans in the jar, which is peculiar because, you know, that's clearly in disagreement with our first experiment. But before we jump to conclusions, we're going to be good scientists and just complete all three experiments. So we open the jar, take out the jelly beans one by one until there are no jelly beans left in the jar that we could see or touch. And we find that there's only five jelly beans that we took out. So we have to deduce that there are only five jelly beans in the jar. So let me just recap our experiments and the results real quick. We did three experiments. The energy experiment said 100 jelly beans. The weight experiment said 30 jelly beans. And the counting experiment said five. Now, at this point, we have to make an assumption. We assume that all three experiments were conducted in an appropriate manner, no cheating, and you know, no funny business going on. If we make this assumption, logically, all three experiments should be giving us the number. So we're left no choice but to make a, a fairly weird set of deductions. We did use the following. We did use that in the jar, there were five jelly beans that had energy, had weight. We could see them and we could touch them. Those are the five jelly beans we took out when we opened the jar and, and took them out one by one. But then we did use that there's an additional 25 jelly beans that have energy and have weight, but we couldn't see them or touch them. So it's when we weighed the jar, we found that there were 30 only five of them we were able to pick out, leaving 25 that were unaccounted for. And then finally, there's an additional 70 jelly beans. The majority of the jelly beans in the jar have energy, but we can't weigh them or see them or touch them. We only deduce their existence by measuring the calories. And then because, you know, we're being scientists here, scientists love giving names to things, which is going to give them names. So we're going to call the five jelly beans that we could see and touch matter jelly beans. The 25 jelly beans that we could weigh but couldn't see or touch, we're going to call them dark matter jelly beans. And the 70 jelly beans that only had energy and we couldn't see, touch, or weigh, we're going to call them dark energy jelly beans. And this is essentially where analogy stops because it turns out when you do a similar thing with the universe, you get similar results. So if you know, go out and measure the total energy in the universe, you get you know, 100. And then if you weigh the universe, you get 30. And if you, uh, you know, look out and count, you get five. And what this tells us is that the majority of the universe, 70% of the universe is made up of the substance that we call dark energy. And this dark energy, both its physics and origin are currently unknown. Additionally, 25% uh, is made out of dark matter, which is equally mysterious to dark energy finally leaving only 5% of the universe uh, made out of this regular matter. These are the things that we can see and touch and interact with. That's you, me, the planets, the stars, and everything we interact with. And this is why understanding the nature of dark matter and dark energy are two of the most fundamental problems in modern day physics. So what does any of this have to do with weighing the universe? Well, it turns out that understanding the nature of dark matter and dark energy depends on understanding how much dark matter and dark energy there are. You know, how they behave is coupled to their quantities. So if I can weigh the universe more accurately, you know, is it 25% dark matter or is it actually 26? Is it 24.6? The more accurately I can weigh the universe, the more accurately I can tell how much dark matter there is. And that means the more accurately I can tell how much dark energy there is, which would allow me to use some results about their nature and physics. So I'm hoping that at this point you're fairly convinced, okay, cool. I, I'm happy to admit that weighing the universe seems interesting, but how am I gonna do that? It's not like I can just pick up the universe and you know put it on a scale. And you're right, you can't. Instead, you can do a couple of methods that take advantage of the physics of the universe. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do it, but I want to focus on, on a way that I personally like that relies on gravity. So the way gravity works, according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, 
is that objects that have mass, objects that have weight, they bend the space around them. So, you know, this sounds pretty weird, but if you look at this GIF here, it illustrates that quite nicely. You have a heavy object here, like a planet, and it's bending the space around it. And then you have a slightly lighter object here, kind of like a moon, and it also bends the space, just not nearly as much as the heavier object. So what happens is, is the lighter object keeps falling around the heavier object in orbit, kind of like how the moon orbits the Earth. So gravity just tells us that heavy objects bend space, and the heavier the object, the more space bends. So far, so good. It turns out that when space is bent, it affects more than just matter, more than just objects that have mass. It turns out that it also affects light. So if I have an object radiating light, like a star in the background that you see here, and the light you know, normally travels in a straight line, when it goes near a heavy object, because the space is bent, the path of the light will actually curve. All right, so far so good. Space is bent, causes the light to curve. So what does this have to do with weighing the universe? Well, let me illustrate it using this, this method here. Imagine that you have a light source, the circle we're looking at here. This is a circle that's radiating light at you. And you have your telescope down here. Normally, the way you see things, right, the, the way your eyes work and the way a telescope works is you collect the light coming in from that object and you remap it, you redraw it. So, you know, your light rays are coming in from the circle and it reaches your telescope and you see a circle. So far, so good. Now, imagine I take a heavy object and I place it between you and the star. So here is the your, where you are, and here is the star or the circular light source. And I put a heavy object in between you two. What's going to happen is, is that the light, as we discussed, is going to bend because the space is bent by this heavy object. And it turns out that not only does heavier objects cause more bending of space, which results in more bending of light, the closer you are to the heavy object, the more you're going to bend, because the closer you are to the bent space. So what happens is, is I have this circle here. The light radiated from this area is going to bend more than the light being radiated from this area. Which means that by the time the light gets to my telescope, I'm no longer seeing a circle. My circle is now stretched. I'm now seeing an ellipse. So what this means is if I know the object was supposed to be a circle, I can measure that new shape and use the shape measurement to deduce how much did the light bend. And by figuring out how much the light bends, that tells me how much the space it's in its bending, which tells me how heavy the stuff in that space is. So by simply measuring the shape of faraway objects, I get a measurement of how much weight there is between me and that faraway object. So if I want to weigh the universe, all I essentially need to do is I need to look at distant objects and measure their shapes. And that just gives me how much weight, whether I can see it or not, it gives me how much weight there is between me and that object. Now, at this point, I think it's you know, pretty important to, to let you know that this is not some you know, theoretical only prediction that you know, we sat down in a room and did some math and like, ah, this, this is how the world works and that's it. I mean, we did that. But this is actually an observed, experimentally confirmed physical effect. And you know, this effect is actually normally very subtle, but I'm gonna show you an image of a very exaggerated version of this effect, a real image. So what you see here is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And here's, here's, here's the situation. You see that blue ring over here? That blue ring is actually one of these, similar to one of these blue small objects over there. It's, it's, it's a light source that's very far away from us. And between us and this light source, there is this red big dot you see here that's a fairly heavy object. So this heavy object is bending the light that's coming from this faraway blue object so much that instead of looking like these normal dots you see here, it ends up looking like a ring. You know, again, this is an exaggerated version of effect. This version of this effect is fairly rare, but it is observable. And you know, this is right, right here. So this is not some, you know, some random effect that we came up. But yeah, so now that we know that this effect is real, and hopefully you're convinced that, you know, we have a tool that we could use to weigh the universe, you might be wondering, you know, do we just go out there and discriminately look everywhere? Or are there parts of the universe that are more interesting than others? And the answer is, you know, we kind of do both. So sometimes you'd go out there and look, 
you know, all over the sky and measure faraway objects' shapes. But other times you look at objects of interest. One of these objects of interest is called uh, clusters, galaxy clusters. And before I tell you what they are, I just want to give you a sense of scale here. So these galaxy clusters are a collection of a thousand objects called galaxies. Here's one of those galaxies, right? And each one of those galaxies is a collection of a hundred billion stars. Each one of those stars is somewhat comparable to our very own sun. That, you know, here's a scale image of the sun, and next to it, this right here is our entire planet, Earth. So for reference, this means that this object of interest, this galaxy cluster object, is one with 16 zeros after it times bigger than the Earth. So now that we understand the scale of this object, let me tell you why it's interesting. It turns out that these objects called clusters, the reason they house these galaxies, a thousand of them, the reason they have so many of them in one place, because these clusters have an abnormally large amount of dark matter compared to the rest of the universe. Which means that if I actually not just weigh this object, but also weigh how the object's mass or how much it weighs changes as a function of position. For example, does it weigh the same everywhere? Or is it heavier in the middle and gets lighter on the outside? By doing that, I can actually learn a lot about how dark matter interacts. And that gives me a lot of information about the nature of dark matter. So by looking at these clusters, you can actually learn quite a bit about these mysterious uh, substances. So I think we talked quite a bit about some science stuff. So I, I think it's, it's a good time to do a little bit of a recap. So just to recap what we've talked about so far, we agreed that dark energy and dark matter account for approximately 95% of the universe. Their physics, origin, and nature are not well understood and not presently very well known. We agreed that we can study their nature by weighing the universe because it tells us how much of them there are and their nature happens to determine how much of them there are. And finally, we agreed that we can use the bending of light to weigh the universe and weigh objects of interest like these massive galaxy clusters. So now I finally get to the balloon part. I owe you an explanation. Where does the balloon come in? So I'm gonna to talk to you about an experiment called Superbit. This is an experiment that I work on and it stands for the Super Pressure Balloon Born Imaging Telescope. And all Superbit is essentially is a scale for the universe. It's one of these experiments we use to weigh the universe. Uh, and if you've been paying attention, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, you just convinced me that all I need to weigh the universe is to go out there and take pictures of objects and measure their shapes. Why do I need some fancy, expensive instrument like Superbit to go and do that for me? And you know what? That's a great question. And I want to illustrate why you need to do that with a little bit of an experiment. So if you're listening, I ask you to take out your phone, if you have a camera phone available, I want you to turn on your camera. I have my camera turned on. I want you to stick out your thumb. I want you to aim your camera at your thumb. And I want you to start shaking your camera. Right? And then you take a picture. Okay? Now look at that picture. Does that look like your thumb? Like how it normally looks? Uh, I'm willing to argue that it probably doesn't. In fact, I did this experiment myself not too long ago, and here are my results. This is a picture of my thumb when I wasn't shaking the camera. And here's a picture of my thumb when my camera was shaky. And I'm pretty confident that the shape of my thumb does not look the same in those two images. So this tells us something very important. It tells us that the shape of objects and images depends on the level of shakiness of the camera or the telescope taking that image. And as I mentioned before, the shape change that we use to weigh the universe is actually a very subtle effect. Yeah, I showed you that ring, which is, you know, a very exaggerated version of the effect, but most of the time it's a very subtle effect. So having a shaky cam, even if it's as stable as this cam that took my thumb, picture of my thumb, will introduce noise, it will introduce fake changes to the shape that will give you, you know, some false data or error in your data or noise in your data that will hinder your ability to weigh the universe and weigh objects in the universe. So what you'd normally do, you know, if, if you're trying to picture, take a picture of your thumb or trying to film a movie, you'd use a camera stabilizer like this one right here. So this here is a sta camera stabilizer that they use in action movies to take action shots. And as you see, as the person moves, the camera stays stable and doesn't shake. And that is exactly what Superbit is. 
Superbit is a very fancy telescope stabilizer. In fact, Superbit is so stable that its level of stability is equivalent to threading a needle from a kilometer away. So you could go stand a kilometer away from me and you know hold out a needle, and Superbit stability threads the needle, holds the needle, uh, holds the thread in the needle without touching the edges for half an hour continuously. That's how stable it is. And you know, I've talked a lot about it, so I think at this point I, I can stop talking for a second and I owe you a little bit of a video to show you what Superbit looks like when it's working. So this is a video of us running some tests uh, before uh, we launched in September 2019 out of Timmins, Ontario for a test flight. Uh, so this is just Superbit hanging from the ceiling and we're commanding it, telling it to, you know, look up and down and stay stable or, or, or uh, relocate its position. And the interesting thing is, is if you were in that room at that time and I don't know, had some bad food and were feeling a little gassy, if you were to like burp in the corner of the room, super bit stability is so sensitive that we could actually see this burp in our data. It will be like a bump in the vibrations of the system, which I personally think is really cool, but also really funny. So now you might be thinking, okay, cool. So where does the balloon part come in and how does one of these balloon launches look like? So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to talk you through uh, the launch process of the 2019 Superbit launch that happened out of Timmins, Ontario. It was a flight dedicated to us testing our telescope to ensure that it's ready for a science flight that will be 100 nights, 30 to 100 nights long out of Wanaku, New Zealand in 2021. So what you do is, is you take some inspiration from up and you attach a small balloon to your experiment and you fill this balloon with just enough helium to make sure that your um, entire system is like weightless, right? So once you do that, you then take an even larger balloon and you connect this large balloon to the smaller balloon. And then you take this large balloon and you fill it with 400,000 cubic meters of helium. So for reference, 400,000 cubic meters, that's equivalent to, if we had, let's say we had 600 people in my house right now, can't hold that many people. Let's say we had 600 people in my house. I could give each one of those people 20,000 kegs of beer, and that would still only just start to fill this balloon. That's how big this balloon is. And then you let the system go to launch. And you just release this balloon and it slowly starts rising, you know, because it's a helium balloon. And when it's fully extended, as you can see here, it's actually almost two thirds of the height of the CN Tower in Toronto. This system is huge. Uh, and you know, I'm not just gonna tease you by talking about the launch. In fact, I brought with me a video of the launch. So I'm gonna let you enjoy our most, one of our, one of my personal most enjoyable moments, which was the September launch. So they never asked that? So I'm sure you can hear the excitement in my advisor's voice uh, as it launched. So uh, what happens is, is that you let it go and you wait until it gets to 35 kilometers above sea level. And once it gets there, then you rush to your ground stations. This is the Superbit team. And you know we're all over our computers essentially driving this experiment. Uh, and you, know, you wait until you're 35 kilometers above sea levels and then you can start taking some pictures. So at this point, I want to show you one of the pictures that we took in our 2016 test flight. This is not a science grade picture, but it's what we call a pretty picture. It's taken just for aesthetic beauty. And the reason I want to show you this specific picture is because I want to highlight something extremely cool, I think, about, about uh, Superbit. So this is the picture Superbit took. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to superimpose on top of this image, the image of the same object taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, right? So ready for it? Boom. Did you see that? There, let me do it again. There. So what you notice here is that Hubble's field of view is significantly smaller than ours. And that's one of the reasons Superbit is really interesting is because it has this huge field of view, you know, 30 to 36 times bigger than Hubble's. And this field of view allows Superbit to take pictures of these interesting objects we talked about called clusters. It could take a picture of the entire giant cluster in one image. 
and you know this, this is one of the coolest things about Superbit. And in fact, that's what we do. So this is a picture of a cluster from the 2019 launch. I took this picture in mid-September, and uh, this is a fairly famous cluster. And you know, there it is. All these almost a very large number of these dots are, are galaxies that are composed of billions, hundreds of billions of stars. Uh, yeah, and and we took this image, and you know we got happy, yay! And now we've proved that Superbit works, and we're ready for our our hundred night science flight. But unfortunately, as always, all things that fly must land, and all good things must end. And the system comes down landing in the forest. And what happens is with landings, you normally get some damage. This year we had a little bit more damage than usual, but it's fine. So you go in, you pick up this, the destruction, you throw away the things that aren't working anymore in the trash, and you rebuild the system to get ready for your next flight. Here's a picture of me packing up so we can head back to Toronto and have a good night's sleep after months and months of hard work. And that's pretty much it. So with that, I want to give a, a huge thank you to the uh, Superbit team. Uh, they're a phenomenal group of people to work with. And I want to thank these institutions at the top right here as well for supporting this experiment. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, also, please follow us on Instagram. It'll make my advisor really happy. And feel free to contact me on my personal email with any questions. Thank you so much, Shaban. We're going to head now to our coordinator, Celia Dew, for questions from our YouTube audience. Celia? Yeah, so we have a question um, that, yes, the universe is heavy, but what about geomagnetic reversal? What implications is that going to have? So, sorry, can you, can, you, can you repeat the last part? Yeah, um, what implications will geomagnetic reversal have on the universe? Uh... <laughs> That's yeah. That's that's an interesting question. So, geomagnetic reversal has to do predominantly with the planet, not with the entire universe. So this actually wouldn't really affect what we do. I mean, it would affect it in the sense that you know might impact electronics temporarily or something, but it, it doesn't. It it wouldn't impact the universe on the scales we're interested in. We're interested on scales, as I mentioned, you know, billions and billions of times larger than the Earth. Great. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then we have another question. Could dark matter and energy be effects resulting from a multiverse? Oh, that's that's an interesting question. So it kind of depends on who you ask, right? So I'm sure a lot of our theorist friends could sit down and come up with a couple of ideas that would say, yeah, the, you know, they are effects that come out from, from, from other universes. But in science, it's always good to... Um, follow the philosophical principle of Occam's razor, which is you try to go along the path of least resistance, the path that least disagrees with the uh, existing body of knowledge. So when we think about dark matter and dark energy, uh, most of the time we think about them in the context of fluids, uh, and rather than, you know, you know I, they are mysterious and they are very unknown, especially dark energy. But when we think about them as fluids and, you know, we, we do the math, we get some predictions that indicate that they should at least behave somewhat in these manners that uh, we've modeled them as. So th to answer your question, you know, I, I know this is a bit of a cop-up, but to answer your question, you know, a good theorist could probably have something like that written up, maybe something like that even already exists. Uh, but the consensus would be to follow a more likely explanation, something like a particle we haven't detected yet for dark matter and for dark energy, something like, I don't know, uh, vacuum energy, like energy that is embedded into the vacuum of space. These would be, you know, approaches I would take before I start thinking about multiverses. Awesome. That's, that's a good answer. Thank you. Uh, we have a non-serious question. Uh, which city has the best ice cream? Oh, that's actually, so I know it doesn't sound serious, but for me personally, that's a serious one. But the the best, I, I actually rank them. And my best ice cream I've ever had was in, in Barcelona in Spain, a place called Agui. Uh, but overall as a city, I think Rome had the best ice cream if you like average over all the shops but the single best gelato or ice cream i've ever had was uh, in, in barcelona yeah we have a couple of volunteers who also agree with you that rome has the best ice cream <laughs> so you're the ice cream expert then um we have another question why do we need to measure dark matter or energy from the stratosphere or from the underground as in the case of snow lab that's that's a great great question so there's two parts to this, to the answer. So let me first address to this, the stratosphere part. So what, because what we do is, as I said, these shape measurements, 
So what we're doing is we're looking at uh, optical images. Uh, and as I mentioned, what happens is, is these things radiate light and you collect the light. The problem is, is that if you're down here on Earth, you have a thick layer of atmosphere that the light has to go through before it gets to your telescope. And the atmosphere is actually turbulent. So the atmosphere is shaking. So what happens is, is if you're not in the stratosphere or you know even above you know in space, what happens is, is this, the atmosphere of the Earth introduces the shaky cam effect we talked about. It's very subtle, but you know it's why things like stars twinkle. It introduces the shaky cam effect into your data, which makes it harder to do. And that's why you try to be above the atmosphere as much as possible to avoid this shaky cam effect that the atmosphere introduces. And this, you know, this is why Hubble telescope and JWST and all these space telescopes operate in space because they get to avoid that. Uh, another reason why you'd want to operate up there is because, you know, thankfully our atmosphere blocks most of the UV light, which is, you know, why we don't get sick uh, from it. But UV light happens to be very useful at telling you how far away objects are. Uh, so you want a telescope that can see light in the UV to tell you how far away the objects are so that, you know, you can, instead of saying, oh, I weighed the entire universe, you can say, I guess I, I weighed ha half of the universe because this object is half a universe away from me. Uh, so this is why we go to the stratosphere. Now, the under lab exper underground experiments like Snow Labs or T2K or these kind of, these, these class of experiments, uh, the, what they do is slightly different. So they're, they're doing what's called the direct detection. So they're trying to actually detect the particle itself of dark matter. We're trying to detect the distribution. Uh, and because they're trying to detect the dark matter, they're trying to detect, uh, they follow the theories that say that, well, if dark matter is a particle, it must be a very weakly interacting particle. So it actually the weak force, uh, or, you know, just it's a particle kind of like neutrinos, if you've heard of those, things that don't interact a lot with, with um, uh, you know, like our normal detectors. So by going underground, what you do is, is you remove a lot of the other gunk that would be coming in from space because that stuff will not reach you because it's interacting with, you know, the floor of the earth is protecting you. It's giving you like a protective layer. Uh, and that way you ensure that the only things you're detecting that deep underground or that much underwater in the case of T T T2K uh, are these things that interact only very weakly. I hope this answers your question, but it's a really good question. Thank you. Yeah, that was, I think, a really great explanation um, of why it's sort of like either up there or below ground. Um, so we have another question. Is dark energy and matter distributed evenly throughout the universe? It's a great question. So the, with dark matter, the answer is no. So that's why I mentioned these things called clusters are interesting, because they're areas that have more dark matter than the rest of the universe. Uh, in fact, you know, there are images uh, that I'd be happy if you email me, I'd happy to share with you of simulations, but also of, of data that show you sort of the distribution of dark matter as a function of space. Uh, now, with regards to dark energy, uh, that's a hard question. Um, I, I'm going to say I don't know. And I'm also going to say that I'm fairly confident that experimentally speaking, we don't really know. Uh, theorists might have ideas of how dark energy would be distributed if it was a fluid like system or whatever, uh, you know, like people say it's vacuum energy, that means it would be everywhere. But to be quite honest with you, we, we don't know. Dark energy is that mysterious that it's, it's very, very not well understood. Oh, thank you. Um, and I have one question. Uh, how did you get into this project and sort of like how long has this project been ongoing and sort of what are the next steps? That's, that's a great question. So. Again, two parts. So first I'll answer, how did I get into this project? So I, my primary interest since I started undergrad has always been cosmology. I've always been interested in the large scale structure of the universe. And throughout my undergrad, I developed an instrumentation. This project happened to do both. You use instrumentation to study the large scale structure of the universe. So I, I talked to the people who were kind of asked to be involved and have been with them since 2018. Now, this project itself started in 2015. Uh, well, it started development in 2013 and had its first test flight in 2015. Um, and since then, it's had a 2016, 2015, 2018, and 2019 flights. So it had a first test flight to ensure that the system could point. Then it had another flight to ensure that the uh, system can stabilize to the level of stability I was talking about, where you can thread a needle, it can you know, give you that level of stability. And then it had a, a flight in 20, 2018 to ensure that you know all of our software and, and, and everything functions smoothly. And then finally, our 2019 flight was to test that the telescope operates the way we want it to. 
and in order for us to declare that we're ready for a science flight. And then uh, the aim is sometime in 2021, uh, around sometime between January and March, uh, might be delayed because of COVID, but we'll see. Uh, we're going to have a 30 to 100 night flight out of Wanaka, New Zealand, where we're going to look out in the sky and weigh as much as we can. Specifically, we're going to try to weigh 150 of these cluster objects and use them to make deductions about what aspects of the universe um, are dominated by dark matter and how much dark matter there is and whether or not dark energy evolves with time and things like that. Amazing. So you'll be going to New Zealand then? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So we launch out of our science launches are out of New Zealand uh, over the ocean and our test launches are out of Timmins, Ontario and Palestine, Texas. Amazing. <laughs> Um, we have another question coming in. After such a hard landing, can you be confident in the rebuilt hardware? Will you need more test flights? Do you plan for the hardware to be reused after your major long-term mission next year? That's a that's a really good question. And the answer, I'm sorry, but the answer is going to be a little bit long. <laughs> so the first part is the following. Um, after hard landings, we are normally confident that the system will work, mainly because we thir we rebuild using the same uh, engineering architecture and also using the same electronic cards and electronic systems as that what flew. And then after we rebuild, we thoroughly test to ensure that it performs to the same manner it did right before the previous flight. So no, I, I, we, we, are, we, are, we are considered science ready. We don't think we need any more test flights. Uh, and yes, yeah, so, so, and we are somewhat, you know, you can never be 100% confident, but we are, you are somewhat confident that it will perform at least as well as the last test flight. Uh, now, the second part of the question, which was, do we intend to recover the system and reuse it? So oftentimes in ballooning, that does happen. In our case, out of Wanaka, New Zealand, if you do the math, I mean, if we could, we will. But if you do the math, it is most likely that we're going to terminate over the ocean. And if we terminate over the ocean, it means that the entire system is going to crash into the ocean, which makes it very unfeasible. To, you know, things that land in the ocean are, are fairly hard and very expensive to find unnecessarily. We can just rebuild it for much cheaper. So if it lands in the ocean, we don't intend to recover it. If it lands not in the ocean, we're going to try our best to recover it. But that brings up a, a very cool point, which is because we have limited bandwidth, uh, the, our data that we take when we're up there, uh, the way we recover it, in case, you know, in case, as I said, we land in the ocean, we can't get our data. We actually have our hard drives parachuted down to land with GPS so we can go find our hard drives before the thing crash lands in the water. I hope that answers your question. That's a really interesting tidbit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think this might be our last question and it's more of a personal opinion, I guess. Do you believe that we're alone out here in the universe? <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a good question as well. Um, yeah, this sort of depends on who you ask, right? A lot of people will say something along the lines of, yes, for sure. Some people will say, uh, oh no, there's definitely aliens. Some people will say maybe, maybe not. And my answer is going to be a little bit unsatisfactory, which is, I don't think I have enough data to comment. You know, I'm a very, as an experimentalist, I'm a very data driven person. Statistically speaking, to me, it seems highly unlikely that there's other intelligent life out there, but not totally unlikely that there's other life out there, you know, maybe like bacteria or, or maybe even slightly more complex life. But to me, it seems like the odds of intelligent life are probably pretty low. That being said, there's not enough, there's just simply not enough data on this topic for me to comment with any knowledge. Like my opinion is as good as yours on this subject and as good as anyone's, because uh, no one really knows. I hope. On behalf of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre and the RASC DDO committee, I'd like to thank Shaban for sharing this fascinating presentation with us. It's so interesting to know what we know about the universe, but also how much we don't know. Thanks also to our technical support team, Andrew Reed, Betty Reed, Ward Legro, and Ennio Cellucci, and to our coordinator, Celia Du, for organizing this event and fielding questions from the YouTube chat. A special thank you to all our viewers for joining us this evening and for your questions. This talk is part of a series of lecture nights at the David Dunlap Observatory online, offered through the partnership of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre, and the City of Richmond Hill. For a complete schedule of RASC events, please visit us online at 
R-A-S-C-T-O dot C-A. Our next lecture night at the DDO online will feature Rupinder Brar discussing Einstein's great prediction, the discovery of gravitational waves. That will be June 6th at 7.30 p.m. Hope to see you back here for the live stream of that event.